Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the first Leaders in Philanthropy event at the University of Chicago of 2021. My name is Keelan Schneider, Senior Associate Director of Donor Relations, and I am delighted to welcome all Maroon Royalty, Chicago, Harper, Odyssey Scholarship, and Phoenix Society members, as well as their guests, to tonight's virtual program. Your steadfast commitment to the university is astounding, especially as we continue to navigate these challenging times. And I'm particularly amazed and inspired by your recent support to the university's community support initiative. When the pandemic began and the decision was made to send students home, leaving the campus dining halls empty, the university made a commitment to continue to employ dining contract workers many of whom live in neighboring communities. So the university created a program that involved those workers at Safe Social Distance, preparing food for local communities in need. In partnership with the generosity from donors like you, the university was able to provide more than 317,000 meals to Southside residents facing food insecurity from March to August of 2020. Those meals were prepared in partnership with Campus Dining and six local minority and women-owned caterers and distributed in partnership with the Greater Chicago Food Depository at 45 sites across the university's nine neighborhood focus area. The university also recognized that small business and nonprofit organizations would be hit hard during the pandemic, especially before government funding was made available. So again, due to your support, the community support initiative was able to provide bridge grants totaling more than $1.2 million to more than 200 Southside small businesses and 79 Southside nonprofits. So this evening, I'm excited to celebrate you, our most steadfast and generous supporters. I'm also thrilled to have the opportunity to learn more about the partnership between the University and the South Side and the impact on the community. Now, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Derek Douglas, Vice President for Civic Engagement and External Affairs at the University. Derek joined the University of Chicago in 2012. He oversees the university's engagement with the city of Chicago and neighboring communities on the South Side and works with internal and external partners to advance urban economic development, enhance the quality of life for local residents, and enrich the work of university faculty and students through research, education, and direct engagement. Prior to joining New Chicago, Derek served in the Obama White House as special assistant to the president, where he led work on urban and metropolitan policy issues. Derek, thank you so much for joining us this evening. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Keelan. Um, thank you for that introduction. And thank you, thanks all of you for joining us this evening. It's really a pleasure and a delight for me to be with you and to share some of the work the University of Chicago has been doing to support our community on the south side of Chicago. And what I'm really excited about actually is I will have some guests later who are the actual people doing the work and the organizations that we've been partnering with in the work to tell you a bit about their engagement and what they've been doing. Um, to set up the panels, which I'm, we'll, I'll be bringing on later, I wanted to start by um, giving a little bit of background, setting a little context for how the University of Chicago um, goes about its work in the community. And I say that because um, it has evolved quite a bit um, in my time here, but if you take it all the way back, it's evolved over the course of the university's history. Um, as Keelan mentioned, before I joined the University of Chicago, I worked in the White House for President Obama, where I was leading urban policy. And one of the um, things I got to experience in that job was I got to travel all around the world and all around the country and visit cities and listen to some of the challenges, some of the issues they're working on and some of the best practices. And it was through that work that I realized the critical role that universities, anchor institutions can play in their communities. 
And so when the opportunity came to join the University of Chicago, when I talked to President Zimmer, who articulated his vision for having a university that could be a model for how a university engages with the community around it, it's been very exciting and rewarding for me to be here and um, to continue and to lead that work. Now, to understand where we are and kind of how we've evolved, I think it's important to also look back at the history of civic engagement at the university. And what a lot of people don't know is that the very first president of the university, William Rainey Harper, was one of the leading voices in articulating the importance of a university having an impact outside the walls of the institution. And there's some wonderful quotes and some wonderful language that he talks about in setting up the University of Chicago in that because it was going to be in the city on the south side, that it had a quality that was distinctively urban. And because it was urban, it had a responsibility to think about how the work it could do and could have an impact beyond its walls and how it could be accessible to those beyond its walls. So things like the first school of social work and other things that started with the University of Chicago, the distance learning, all came out of this notion of the importance of civic and community engagement as being connected to the university. Now, if you take the full evolution forward, we, we recognize that there were periods of time in our history where um, the university was more inward looking. And a lot of that took place in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where some of the relationships between the university and the community started to, to fray. But in the last 20 years, I would say, particularly under President Zimmer's leadership, the last 15 or so, there's been this renewed commitment by the university to really have an impact, a partnership, if you will, with the community and the, and the organizations and the people around it. And um, in my mind, there's been a true revolution about how we do that work. I remember when I joined the university nine years ago, um, I was there to lead the Office of Civic Engagement and the Office of Civic Engagement was doing great work. We had some great programs, but it was a little bit disconnected from the rest of the university. And while we were doing the work, there were pockets, but I wouldn't say that it was part of the DNA or the fabric, civic engagement. But if you look at us now, um, civic engagement is really now a university-wide commitment. I can say that firmly. Um, if you look at all the various schools, the divisions, many of the administrative units, they have civic engagement staff that are focused on thinking about how their schools, how their departments, how their divisions can work and partner and have an impact um, in the community. Um, and I think that's one of the features that actually is distinguishing for the University of Chicago in doing this work, where at other universities, you may have an office, you have a department, that's what they do while the rest of the university goes about its business. It's really become part of the fabric. I think another thing that has evolved in our work is this idea of partnership or mutual benefit. And the way I like to describe that is um, when you think about this work, you can come at it from a couple of different vantage points. One is you could say, well, we're a wealthy institution. This is our moral responsibility. We need to do something for the community. It's not that we're benefiting in any way. We're not getting anything out of it, but we're gonna just do it the right thing and give to the community. Um, nothing wrong with those sorts of ideas and doing things for the community, but we have a little bit of a different view. The way we approach it here is we think about this idea of mutual benefit, where by engaging, we are, yes, supporting, helping to advance and improving the community, but the university and those of us in the university also benefit and learn from the community. And it's this notion of finding those opportunities where we both benefit and can both advance these causes, that's really the sweet spot for the work. Um, the other thing that has been a part of our fabric has been the way we, the issues that the university focuses on. And I'm really proud of the fact that um, a lot of the work that we do is focused on some of the most pressing challenges that the city faces. Keelan talked about our work around COVID-19. And the reason why we were able to stand up in, in a matter of just a week or two, a program to provide meals, to support small businesses, to support nonprofits, is because we already had a foundation of working with those organizations and with those partners 
do our regular work. Um, and when you look at the different themes and areas that the University of Chicago is involved in, it ranges from K through 12 education, um, where there's a lot of work going on, investing in working with CPS. We have charter schools of our own. Um, a lot of research in that space. Or community health, if you think about the work being led by the medical center um, around community health, trauma, and the like. Um, economic opportunity and entrepreneurship. We're gonna talk a bit about more, that more later, so I won't delve, delve into that now. Also civic infrastructure is another area of focus, which is really thinking about the capacity of the organizations and the individuals in the communities that we partner with. Um, public safety is another area where there's a lot of activity across the university. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the work of the Crime Lab or Deb Gorman-Smith, who's the Dean of the Crown Family School but there's a variety of areas and people that are involved in that. And another big area of focus is arts and culture and thinking about how the university's work in arts and culture can connect in and support the vast array of arts and cultural activity and programming and leadership in the communities. What I think is powerful about our work in these areas though, is that it's not a one unit show. Yes, the Office of Civic Engagement plays a role, but we are one of many. And we had someone come in a few years ago to look at our programs and they found that we have over 200 programs across the University of Chicago that are involved in civic and community engagement kind of activity. And in these areas that I just mentioned, those are the areas where we're going um, the deepest and I think are starting to have a really profound impact in the community. Now, in terms of the role of the Office of Civic Engagement, I'm actually excited that we are one of many. I, I'm excited that now, nine years later, when I look around, a lot of our deans, there's people all over the place doing the job very similar to myself. Because to me, it's a sign that this has been embraced as part of the fabric of the university. It's part of the culture of the university. And I think that from a community perspective, while we have a lot more work to do, there's no doubt about it, the perception of the university and its commitment to the community has changed for the good over the, the recent years. So in civic engagement, which is the group I lead, we play a supportive role where we work with a variety of units and faculty to help them in their development of their programming and to build partnerships and the like. But we also drive work ourselves. Um, and we focus on a subset of those um, issues. We focus on student civic engagement and creating opportunities for students to go out and work in community. We focus on civic leadership and how do we build the next generation of leaders in Chicago and leverage the, ac the faculty and academic resources of the university to do this. We focus on college readiness and access and how do we make sure that kids across the city of Chicago can get an opportunity to go to college and succeed in college and be ready for college. And there's a variety of work we do. And then there's two other areas, and those are going to be the focus of our programming tonight, and that's nonprofit capacity building and economic inclusion. Um, non uh, let me start with economic inclusion because that's the first one um, that we're going to have. And I would like to, I'm going to bring in a couple of partners to join me with this. Um, Alyssa Berman Cutler, she is the executive director of community development in the Office of Civic Engagement. She leads an initiative that we started, she'll talk about it, but some years ago called You Chicago Local. And it's focused on leveraging the economic power and strength of the university to have an impact in the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, with Alyssa, we're gonna be joined by um, Eric Williams, who is a not affiliated with the university. He is the owner of a business in the heart of 53rd Street in Hyde Park called The Silver Room a tremendous community asset, a tremendous community leader. If you haven't been to his um, block, Silver Room block party in the summer, with COVID, we can't do it. But when COVID's done, you might want to check it out where he brings thousands of people to Hyde Park to engage and to celebrate and enjoy um, what the community has to offer. And so this area of economic inclusion is one we've really tried to double down on in recent years, because when you think about a university, the mission is education and teaching, but a core function 
is the economic power of a university. And so when we think about civic engagement, we want to leverage all aspects. And so we spend a lot of time focusing on leveraging the purchasing, hiring, and other power of the institution. So I want to start with a couple of questions. Um, and we'll engage Alyssa and Eric in a Q&A. But Alyssa, I'd like to start with you. And could you share a brief overview of U Chicago Local? Some people may not have heard about it, the genesis of it, and what we try to do through that program. Sure, thanks, Derek. And I'm so pleased to be here. Um, you really set it up exactly right. So um, we, we talk about U Chicago Local as thinking about how we can leverage our operations as an anchor and as a business of the university to be a good economic development partner on the South Side. Um, so we particularly think about that in three areas. We think about it in terms of our purchasing and buy local, our hiring and employment, um, and then our real estate development and live local. So on the buying side, um, we think about it in terms of both really large contracts and how might we move those to folks um, who are doing business on the south side. And then even when we're thinking about you know, big vendors, how can we make sure that we include um, provisions in their contracts that say that they need to work more closely with small business on the south side. Um, but then because we are so invested in our commercial corridors and businesses like Eric's, um, we also think about it in terms of our small purchasing and all of our employees with um, university credit cards and how can we sort of incentivize them and promote businesses so that even those small purchases are going to um, small local businesses as well, because that can really add up when you're talking about the kinds of um, numbers of employees that we have. Um, and then we can also bring in our strength as an educational institution. Um, so because we have an incredible business school, which many of you might be a part of, um, we've been able to use the strength of our students and our professors to provide support and capacity building to businesses, um, both those who are in our supply chain um, and those who are just providing that um, incredible wealth to the neighborhood um, through the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship um, and the Small Business Growth Program, um, being able to support them in those educational ways. On the hiring side, um, we are the biggest employer on the South Side, and about 30% of our employees come from the surrounding nine neighborhoods around the university. Um, but we think we can do better, and we um, really think about it in terms of how can we lower barriers to entry for employment at the university. Um, so we know that we have an unemployment problem in the neighborhoods around the university. So really looking at our higher local um, policies and practices to see how we can address that. Um, in terms of both, you know, what kind of educational requirements do we have? What other barriers to employment might we have? Um, and then working with our local workforce partners and employment agencies to make sure that they and their clients are connected to opportunities at the university. And then finally, we think about it in terms of um, the physical space. Um, so we have a live local program where we try to incentivize folks to um, buy homes and to rent um, homes around the university to be closer part of our community. But then we also look at our, our real estate development um, writ large and think about how that can be a force for positive economic development. Um, things like 53rd Street, which Eric will talk about a little bit more, how might we make sure that we are um, having small businesses as well as larger businesses bringing employees um, as we have when we built um, the Harper Court Center to be there every day so that they can eat at the restaurants and shop at the businesses. Um, so being a little bit more thoughtful about our real estate development in that way as well. Terrific. And, and I, I appreciate you describing it in that way because I think the, the interesting thing or the, the, the critical thing about you, Chicago Local, is when an institution engages and does civic engagement, you can have a range of programs that you set up to work outside the university but or the institution. But the question is, what is the institution changing about its own practices yeah. that has an impact? And you just described our hiring, our purchasing, our built environment, and changing the way we do things to have a broader impact. So Eric, you're a small business owner. You move from Wicker Park to Hyde Park in 2015. And um, you've become just, I think, an integral part of the community since you've been here. It's just been a delight and a tremendous asset. Um, I'd already mentioned the block party you, you run, which brings 50,000 people. Can, can you describe your experiences um, since coming to Hyde Park on 53rd Street, um, the interactions you've had with the university, um, the benefits you see or not see in the local commercial corridor and how that's been developing and what your experience has been as a local entrepreneur? 
Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is a, this is a nice honor to be here with you in a different kind of uh, experience, <laughs> <laughs> not in the store shopping. Yeah. Um, no, you know, so it's, it was uh, very different for me to come down here uh, first as a pop-up uh, first, just to kind of test the waters and see how it would go. Um, coming from the north side with an independent uh, landlord, I didn't know what it would be like to have the university as an actual landlord and later figuring out it's actually a partnership, not just like a tenant landlord relationship. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised. Um, it's been just a fantastic relationship. Uh, the support I've gotten from the university, from the block party to just marketing and promotion to support from, you know, from uh, Creo and all, of, all the other commercial uh, um, stores on the, on the street has just been fantastic. Um, I was immediately embraced, embraced from the neighborhood, you know, and I realized there's a big difference between Wicker Park and, and Hyde Park, because Hyde Park is a community made up of different, you know, subsets. You know, you have the folks from university, you got folks from Kenwood, you got folks from, you know, from South Shore, which is our second biggest market outside of Hyde Park. Um, people shop with intention, you know, and we first moved down there. The first thing I got was like, hope you guys stay, don't leave. We need small businesses on the street. You know, mm -hmm. they would come in and just shop and buy just to ensure that we would not leave. So mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a much more uh, inten intentional relationship I had with the community, people who had pride in Hyde Park, uh, folks from university, folks from outside of university who just wanted to stay. So for me, it's been a great relationship. Uh, the block parties you just mentioned brings, you know, 40, 50,000 people to the neighborhood. It's a cultural celebration, as importantly, it's an economic boom for the community. Uh, over $2 million is generated uh, because of this yeah. event. We have over 100 sm uh, vendors uh, in the community, uh, down 53rd Street, who are, who are making money that day. The restaurants are all full. It's just a, break, it's a great celebration to also highlight and showcase Hyde Park from people who actually never been to Hyde Park before. I hear it all the time. They live on the north side. They had never seen Hyde Park before. And yeah. they hear about you know, the south side and there are, sometimes it sparks fear and to come to this community that is diverse, it's beautiful. Um, everyone seems to get along. It's just been a great experience for me. So I, I appreciate Terrific. it. Terrific. And I remember with the block party at first when you were putting the idea out before people experienced it, they were, whoa, all these people come into Hyde Park, what's going to happen? What's it going to be like? Now for those businesses, they can't wait for the block party <laughs> because that's their best day of the year. <laughs> Without, their a, business without question. <laughs> so it's been it's been great. Alyssa, turning back to you, you know, I talked in the opening about our approach to civic engagement and how partnerships at the center. I would imagine some of the folks listening wonder how we go about making decisions. And as you know, we've tried to put a much greater emphasis on not having a top-down approach, but more of a bottoms-up approach and treating and engaging with the community as partners in our thinking and developing our work. Um, recently, you led the effort to gather local input on how we could essentially improve our work around you, Chicago Local, and as an economic anchor. I was wondering if you could share the experience and the process that you used for that and what we learned through that process. All right. So we've, um, we had started you, Chicago Local a few years ago and really spent those first couple of years getting our own house in order, understanding what we were spending, understanding what our hiring looked like, figuring out what we could do easily sort of internally. Um, but then last year, we convened a set of working groups that we um, called the umbrella of the community development working group. And those included stakeholders from the three economic development areas that I mentioned um, on the uh, business support side, on the employment support side, and on the housing and real estate side, um, both practitioners from our neighborhood um, and from around the city, some just residents um, who are interested in those fields, and then some folks who had been real critics of ours, um, particularly um, around the um, request for a community benefits agreement around the coming of the Obama Presidential Center. And so what we really wanted to do was get all of those voices in the room and talk about how we could partner to um, uh, improve and increase the kinds of activities that we were already doing um, and work together to do others. Um, it was really very successful and we continue to meet actually quarterly, um, which continues to allow us to do some new partnerships um, and accountability, frankly, for us, we're still sharing out our data, talking about what we're doing, um, you know, shifting uh, some, some ideas, especially, you know, this year around COVID. Um, one example that I like to give is on the employment side. So we 
um, as we were talking to our HR folks, realized that we actually had um, pretty liberal policies around hiring folks with criminal backgrounds into the university, but that this was something that our community absolutely didn't know, that people were self-selecting out of applying for positions at the university. Um, and so we did a big effort to write some language that in, in collaboration um, with these partners that um, was something that they felt like they could share out with their community. And that's now on every job posting that says that we are a fair chance employer. Um, and then more importantly, really working with them so that they know that they should send people to us, that every person will be looked at individually, that almost no one um, gets rejected because of criminal background, um, especially if they're honest about it. When it is, it's usually you know something where it's directly related to a position, usually white collar, that kind of thing. Um, so that was a really example where listening to our community helped us just make a tweak to what we were doing and can be really impactful in terms of reaching those folks with barriers to employment. Thanks, and I think that you pointing out that in putting it together, um, your decision to not just have at the table those who support the university or who are friendly, but also the biggest critics of the university. And to tell them, we want you at the table to challenge us and to push us and to push back on what we're doing because that's how we can do the work better. I think that um, that, was, that wasn't always the way that we did engagement. I can tell you that, but I think moving in that direction and the transparency that you brought to it has been very, very informative and beneficial. Um, Eric, back to you. I mean, you've done, you did such a tremendous job in Hyde Park when the university was thinking about building out its, the, the area in Washington Park where we have the arts block and we're working with arts and cultural organizations to redevelop the block on 55th Street between King Drive and Prairie. Um, the arts and public life folks tapped you to help them um, think about supporting the small business incubator and developing the concepts around that. Can you share a little bit about L1 and what your involvement has been there? Sure. So L1 is an incubator program on 55th Street um, that we, we have three entrepreneurs that we're going to take through a real life experience of having a retail store. How do you run a retail store? And me using my 25 years plus <laughs> uh, of experience on how to run a retail. And this it kind of came about for me, you know, starting my business, not having mentorship, uh, mm. making a lot of mistakes. And over the last 25 years, learning the ins and outs of retail from buying to marketing to now social media um, to, to selling, you know, everything that encompasses uh, what, what retail encompasses, how can I lend a hand to somebody else? And so uh, in partnership with, with USC, we're really taking these three entrepreneurs through a real life experience uh, on how to run retail. And it's been great so far. Unfortunately, you know, because of COVID, we haven't been able to be in the space, but we're doing some things virtually and making connections. And um, it's been a great experience for everybody. Terrific. Um, and for those who don't know, Alyssa referred to, we do the physical environment. And a lot of people are familiar with what we're doing on 53rd Street in Hyde Park. But we've also been doing work that I just referenced in Washington Park, um, in the arts block, and we've been having conversations and there's been a lot of interest in how the university can support local developers in Woodlawn as well. And so in a lot of these cases, we're there to support development. We may not be leading, but um, it just gives a sense of the, of the breadth in which the university and our economic development work has been evolving. Well, look, Eric and Alyssa, I wanna thank you for that. I want you to hang tight because we're gonna come back to you at the end when we have the Q and A session. We really appreciate your insights. For those who are watching, if you want to start put, putting in questions, um, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of, the of your screen where you can type in questions and it can be directed to any of the panelists. You just heard from Melissa, Eric, the ones coming up. And then we'll take questions at the end um, from the audience. Thank you, Alyssa and, and Eric. So now I want to turn to another area of, of civic engagement work. I referenced this when I talked about the work of of OCE. And um, that's our work on nonprofit capacity building. And uh, the University of Chicago, uh, when I was in, actually before I joined the university, when I was in the White House, I was um, 
traveling around the country and I meet with neighborhoods and I meet with communities. And one of the, the number one challenges I heard, you would think that it's oh, the crime, it's the education, it's the health system. Yeah, a lot of that stuff was mentioned, but what I heard as much as anything from the community groups that I met with was this notion of, we need more supports to help build the capacity of our local organizations. Um, and the, so when I came to the University of Chicago, I recognized that there's a correlation, a direct one between those neighborhoods that are thriving and those neighborhoods that have strong civic and community-based organizations that are able to execute the visions that they have for communities. And what you often see, and this is what I heard when I was in the White House, was that um, you'll have neighborhoods that don't have the strong capacity and when the, the grant dollars or the philanthropy is coming, it doesn't go to those neighborhoods because funders will say, well, there's no one to give the money to because I wanna give the money to areas that I, or groups that I know can execute on the mission and put the, the dollars to good use. So seven years ago, um, when I came, I said, we need to develop a program at the University of Chicago that addresses this critical need of nonprofit capacity building. To me, it's one of the a national crises that doesn't get the attention it deserves. You, the community groups, they're on the ground, they're on the streets. They know the needs of their community better than anyone else. And large institutions can do a lot, but the way a lot of our challenges are gonna be solved is by empowering the people in those communities so they can lead, so they can execute, so they can implement. And so we said, let's develop a program that doesn't compete with these groups in delivering services to neighborhoods, but is additive to those groups by helping to strengthen their capacity. And that is the Community Programs Accelerator that we started um, seven years ago. I'm proud to say that over the seven years, we've worked with well over 100 nonprofits across the South Side um, of Chicago. I think it's even, and if you add our workshops, it's well over 200 nonprofits that we've worked with. And we bring them in, we give them capacity building supports. It might be they need to figure out how to put together a strategic plan. They may be working on developing, a. how do I put a board together? How do I do fundraising? Um, how do I get my financial management systems in order? You meet the organizations where they are, you understand what their vision is, and the goal of CPA is to help them get there so when they come out, they're able to be sustainable, they're able to be high performing, and they're able to execute their mission. Um, the other thing I'll just mention briefly is that through CPA, that was one of the programs that we were able to leverage for COVID, just like you Chicago Local that Alyssa referenced, we did all of our small business support because we already had U Chicago Local in place. The Community Programs Accelerator is what we leveraged to support the nonprofits in COVID. Um, and we've given out um, over $600,000 in direct funding and we've helped nonprofits leverage over $800,000 from other funders. Now, what makes the Community Programs Accelerator a success is the organizations and the leaders that we've been fortunate enough to work with. And I wanna welcome one right now, Tamara Holmes, um, to the program. Um, Tamara has been absolutely incredible. I mean, she is, if you don't know who she is now, you're gonna know who she is at some point soon. And she is the founder and CEO of Aerostar Avion Institute. I'm gonna let her describe it and talk about that so you get a sense. Um, but the organization's mission is to expose, educate, and empower young students of color and girls to pursue careers in aviation. I can tell you that she's been a dynamic leader for us. She was one of the first organizations that came through the Community Programs Accelerator. She helped us as much, if not more, than we helped her in understanding how do you work with and support nonprofit organizations in the community doing the work on the ground. So I wanna just welcome her to the program. Now, Tamara, yeah. let's, let's start Thank by you. having you tell the audience a bit about why you launched Aerostar Avion Institute. 
Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's, it's definitely been a pleasure to be a part of the Chicago family. I launched the Aerostar Avion Institute as an answer to a problem that I had uh, as a child uh, in growing up in Maywood uh, from an underserved community, um, the third of seven children. Uh, it was really, really tough. Uh, for my parents to, first of all, keep me in line uh, because uh, I, was, I was one of the rowdy ones of the bunch. But another thing that, um, that I found is that school really didn't know what to do with me. I'm a left and right brain child, uh, probably would have been diagnosed ADD or ADHD. And uh, so I wound up uh, getting uh, exposed to aviation through an airplane ride, the Chicago chapter of Tuskegee Airmen. One Saturday morning, they gave me uh, an opportunity to fly over Lake Michigan. And I was 16 years old and it completely changed my life. Well, I decided to pursue a, pursue a career in aviation and uh, there was no one that could help me in my community. Uh, I wound up doing what everybody told me to do, get good grades to go to college. And when I landed at Southern Illinois University, I was one of only two African-American females in the aviation program in four years. Um, those numbers still look like that. Uh, I was competing against kids whose uncles had airplanes, whose parents were pilots and had been in the industry, and whose grandfathers flew in World War II. Um, and then when I got to corporate, things didn't change. Um, I wound up landing my dream job as a professional aviation consultant. And uh, for seven years, I was the only African American working for the company globally. And that's when I decided that I needed to do something different. I had always gone back and talked to young people about careers in aviation, about how they could uh, get interested or learn more about becoming a pilot, a mechanic, maybe even an astronaut. And when I would go out and talk to young people in schools, um, they literally had no clue what I was talking about. And so I said, oh my gosh, I have to start from the beginning, like cars, is to the automotive industry as airplanes are to the aviation industry. And um, it literally, um, it, was, it was really, it was hard at first because this is like um, it's mental gymnastics, you know, allowing kids to know and learn and believe that they can become something that they had never heard of, that they had not seen. Um, I decided to mentor and create opportunities for young kids to be able to pipeline them into the aviation industry. Uh, we now uh, have an incredible pipeline from kindergarten to career, uh, exposing young people to careers in aviation, educating them with curriculum and content, specifically industry rated, um, uh, giving them and empowering them with the tools that they need to be successful, and then helping them find gainful employment. Uh, and we're happy to say that we've been uh, 12 years in business, uh, four years as a nonprofit, and we'll talk more about that, I, I assume, as we get yeah, yeah. to the conversation. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask about that because, um, you joined the Accelerator program in 2018 and was wondering if you could share with the, the listeners or the viewers how the Accelerator has helped Aerostar over that time. My goodness, we, we, it was literally a godsend of uh, the, the support that came from the Community Programs Accelerator. We were a core award recipient, which means that we not only received the um, $50,000 award, which was $25,000 for two years, but we also received professional development support um, with full access to the University of Chicago and their um, expertise. When we started, um, we didn't have any employees. Everyone was a 1099 contractor. We barely had filed for our own 501c3, um, uh, filed for our nonprofit status uh, because we were in such a bind, uh, and I know this speaks to some of the nonprofit uh, leaders here. Uh, we literally, because we had done so much of the work, our first donation was $50,000 from the Boeing company. And we didn't have a bank account. <laughs> 
uh, we didn't have the infrastructure to partner with uh, an organization like that. Uh, the University of Chicago helped us set up a board of directors. It helped us set up, uh, helped us work with our fiscal agent until we were able to grow up and handle our own finances with our own accountant. Uh, we did a lot of, uh, uh, had a lot of hard conversations about finances and um, I didn't even know that we needed to do a lot of the things financially when we got those type of funds from a funder. You know, that grant went to $125,000 from $50,000 because of the work that we were doing from that one donor. And that's because we went from saying, here's a bunch of great pictures with kids in airplanes, kids flying airplanes, to here's our financial reports. Here's our last meeting minutes. Uh, here are some, of the, here's our strategic plan, uh, strategic implementation matrix, and some of the work that we've been doing um, to be able to bring our organization uh, to build capacity. It, it was an amazing feat uh, what we were able to do with the support um, and under the leadership of the people in the Community Programs Accelerator Office. Um, from board assessments, uh, being able to allow us to see where the board is being effective. For me personally, as a CEO, uh, I was, a, I, I was um, the University of Chicago's uh, Community Programs Accelerator paid for me to go to Axelson Bootcamp for nonprofit CEOs. And I had been in corporate for a while and I was used to being a boss in corporate, right? But philanthropy is really different. Um, learning how to be accountable to the people who you, you brought all, all of them as board members and now you have to be accountable to them. Uh, so the, the reverse roles um, in accountability, uh, stewardship over uh, finances, over resources. And one of the things that I think I probably learned the most about uh, was the importance of strategic planning, you know? Everybody has a great idea, but how do you bring that in idea into fruition, uh, create tools, processes, and infrastructure to, um, to uh, not only build capacity, but then uh, have long-term sustainable success. And that's what the Community Programs Accelerator was able to help us do. Terrific. That's wonderful. And I think that when you describe the breadth of the activities in which they supported on, it's important for the viewers to know that the Community Programs Accelerator works with many partners, both inside the university and externally. So we work with students. We have students from the Harris School or the Crown Family School who then work with the nonprofits to do certain work. We work with faculty across the university. We have a certificate program that we run in nonprofit management that the Crown Family School runs for us. And we also have external partners as well. Um, so it's a total team effort. Wondering in our last few minutes, if you could just speak to COVID. We know COVID has required almost every organization to pivot. And could you just speak to um, what Aerostar has had to do to pivot as a result of COVID? Our, our pivot was actually, um, we had decided that we wanted to get onto an e-learning platform um, for our, uh, for our uh, aviation programs. We had met in January of last year with a consultant to help us move our programs online and we were looking at, to expand our programs to adult learners. Well, come March, schools get closed. All of our kids who are who were in um, programming after school and on Saturdays um, were left without an option. We had to figure out how to get kids online. And because we had already started the process, we literally um, trash the whole idea of adult learners for right now, put it on the back burner and focus all of our attention on getting our young people on the e-learning platform. We did an amazing, amazing job. And I'm not just saying this because it was us. Uh, we launched a brand new product called the Aeroverse. Uh, it is the universe of all things aviation and aerospace education. And that was created out of a specific need to transition our programs onto an e-learning environment. Since we've launched that platform, we have uh, we have had other aviation um, industry professionals and corporations wanting to teach on our platform. Uh, we did work with the University of Chicago's partner, uh, the Law Project, 
to get all of our trademarks and copyrights done pro bono, which was, oh my God, probably $10,000 worth of work for four trademarks. Uh, and the Arrowverse was one of them that we submitted for, uh, for trademark protection. And so it's, that pivot was something that eventually needed to happen, um, but COVID pushed us off a cliff and uh, we were happy to report that within two days of launching that e-learning platform, we had 76 kids registered online. And to date we have, I just checked 330 kids registered in the Arrowverse and 60 of those will be starting program on March the, uh, on February 13th. Unbelievable. <laughs> That's fantastic, wow. So look, this has been great. It's been very informative. What I want to do now is um, I want to bring in some of the other folks because we want to take the last set of time, the next 15, 20 minutes or so for a broader Q&A. And I just want to say, Tamara, that what you've been doing at Aerostar and watching the growth under your leadership has been just inspirational and very rewarding for us. And we're wishing you nothing but the best. And you know, even though you're not in CPA now, we always have your back. Thank and you. so we'll always be there um, to support you. So let me just look now at the, um, we started getting some questions in the, in the chat. And I know one of the questions that's come up is what's in store for OCE's programs, um, specifically the U Chicago Local and the Accelerator in um, 2021. And so I just wanted to speak a little bit to that and then we'll take some of, some of the other questions. First of all, you heard from Melissa already about the work of U Chicago Local. And um, what we're really trying to do with the program now is to scale it. It's had a lot of impact, but we think there's even more we could do at the university to say double the amount of money we invest every year in local businesses to dramatically increase the number of people that get hired from the community at the university, including people who may have records or those who have historically um, not been uh, connected to the university. Our partnership with the Polsky Center, who's done a tremendous amount on thinking about Southside entrepreneurs and how can we help to strengthen and grow those is another area of uh, potential growth that we would like um, to expand. And also our work with the Office of Business Diversity. Um, some of you may be familiar that an area that the university actually is a leader in higher ed is around professional service opportunities for minority and women firms. Where over the last 10 years, we've had well over $100 million invested in minority and women firms. Um, on the accelerator side for 2021, we just got a new executive director who's fabulous and we're thinking about how can we start to scale um, and, and strengthen that program as well. That includes uh, the, the ability to take on more nonprofits in our core program or our associates program. We're looking at some ideas of creating a, an incubator space for nonprofits in the community <clears throat> that could give um, nonprofits access to, to cheap space to co-mingle and collaborate um, with one another. And then um, also thinking about how can we expand the geographic reach. Right now we focused in nine neighborhoods, but we're actually thinking about broadening that reach across the South side and maybe the city because we've heard from so many foundations, funders and others about the, the need and the desire to help strengthen the capacity of the, the nonprofit sector in Chicago. And then finally, overall for OCE, um, we're really focused on deepening our work uh, and our strategic work around civic leadership, um, building out our methods of communications and transparency, because that one of the issues that we've always had to battle is the trust factor. And the way you address the trust factor is you have to build a relationship and you have to be transparent. So we've been doing a lot to try to communicate and increase the way in which we, we share um, the news of what the university is doing. And so those are a few things um, that we're doing. And so now I wanted to see if there's some questions that like we can direct um, to the, the panelists. Um, so here's one for Eric. Um, Eric, Wicker Park has got a vibrant retail market. 
I wonder what the draw and interest was for you to come south. And thanks for bringing us the Silver Room, exclamation point. So you got a fan too. <laughs> Great, awesome. Well, uh, initially the draw was University of Chicago offered me an opportunity to, uh, to do a pop-up for several months. And you know, that was very uh, interesting to me to try this out you know, with, you know, with little or no risk. Um, so that was my initial thought. Um, I wasn't sure how it would go, to be honest with you. I wasn't sure. I'd been in Wicker Park for, for 16 years. Um, but I will say we are three times busier in Hyatt Park than we were in Wicker Park. And I, that's actually even surprising to me. But the reason is I think people think that this commercial corridor in the north side, they're very vibrant. You see a lot of retail stores. But if you look one layer deeper, a lot of these stores are not doing well. You know, their rents are two, three times more than what they're paying, uh, paying uh, per square foot on the south side. And it's also more of a dynamic of people who window shop. You know, they, they like the fact, this idea of having retail in their community, where again, the Hyatt Parkers are very grateful and they're very supportive. So people in, uh, in, in our neighborhood, they actually shop uh, and they don't wanna shop online. They wanna come into the store. There's also a historical context of a community and what it's like to know your neighbor and how you doing, Ms. Jones? And how's your kids? And you know, all the, you know, how you doing, Derek? You know, how's your wife? All, all, you know, all these things. And I think it's a it's a difference from a social standpoint on the north side than the south side, which is much greater on the south side. And you look at High Park is is known as a, you know, as the downtown of the south side. So you have all these surrounding communities that are shopping in High Park from South Shore to Kenwood to Inglewood to, uh, to you know, Washington Park, they all come to Hyde Park. So it's actually much busier uh, Got it. in Hyde Park. Great. Thank you. Alyssa, here's one that I would like to direct to you. The question is, um, what's you Chicago's emphasis in building sustainable community organizations and community economic development in surrounding communities, such as Greater Grand Crossing, South Shore, Chatham and Avalon. I was wondering if you could speak to the network that you put together with economic development organizations and how we're working with them. Yeah, um, so a lot of this comes in part with the community development working group that I talked about um, and really strengthening them in that way. Um, but we also work um, re especially closely, I would say, with the local um, chambers of commerce and economic development organizations that see themselves as business serving. Um, and so that's providing a space for professional development. We'll bring in um, speakers, we'll bring in technical assistance and just a place for them to collaborate and share ideas with each other. Um, and really all of it goes to uh, the sustainability of organizations that I think Derek, you talked about in terms of the CPA as well, that everything we do is really around um, knowing that we can't and shouldn't do it all. Um, that it really is about making sure that we have strong partners. Um, and so bringing that to bear as much as possible. Um, one more example, I think in the economic development side comes from our work um, with housing, um, particularly that we've done recently in Woodlawn, Washington Park, and now in South Shore, um, where we've partnered with a local organization in each of those communities that is housing focused brought them resources from the Harris School, both to have students come out and do some data gathering and then data analysis, and then together um, develop some recommendations that go to the city um, around what they'd like to see in terms of um, housing development and housing policy in their communities. Um, and so I think that's a place where we've really brought something that the university can bring in terms of both um, student man hours and some intellectual capacity from our professors, um, but had the um, community organizations from the ground floor making sure that it's the data that they want and need and can use going forward. Um, so they own that background data. Um, they're using it for a lot of different things depending on the organization. Um, and I think that's a partnership we can replicate in other areas as well. Terrific. And related to that real quick as a follow up, someone also asked a question about um, do we work with CDFIs to encourage lending and investment and maybe the, ch the Chase program where we have a couple of CDFIs we work with, we do capacity, they do lending. Can you speak to Yeah, we're really CDFIs excited over? about this. This is a little bit more nascent um, than some of the stuff we've been working on um, for a couple of years. And it's definitely someplace where we think we can 
um, bring more attention to businesses, um, exactly, I think, as the questioner is asking. Um, but we are launching a program this spring that we're calling the Financial Fundamentals Program um, that we're doing in partnership with three local um, lending institutions and CDFIs, um, Seaway Bank, GN Bank, and Chicago Community Loan Fund, um, where we are providing some um, educational programming for businesses and some student man hours and consulting, um, but then uh, having the bankers be able to come in to give specific advice on how folks can access capital, both from their institutions and at large. Um, you know, this has become particularly relevant with what's been going on with the governmental health and the PPP and many of our hyperlocal businesses having trouble accessing some of it because of the way that they um, had set up their businesses or that records were kept or having a lack of relationship with banks. Um, so trying to bridge that gap um, as both more government and other funds come down the pike in the future. Terrific. Tamara, a question for you is, um, you talked a bit about um, it, uh, the work that you did with the Community Programs Accelerator um, to support your nonprofit. But what do you think, just broadening out, when you think about the broader nonprofit community on the South Side, what supports do you think other nonprofits need to succeed? I think one of the biggest things, and recent studies have shown this over and over again, and I also saw a question about women uh, business owners and women uh, leading philanthropy. Uh, less than 2% of philanthropic dollars actually go to African-American female-led um, nonprofits. And that's a number that we absolutely have to recognize uh, and take a bigger, take a deeper look at why. Why aren't dollars that uh, that are out there for philanthropy going to organizations um, for us that are being led and are doing the work and can show it? Um, I've seen an example over and over again how nonprofits started by non minorities, even in the ten years that I've been doing the work that I've done, have gotten millions of dollars, and we are making pilots, and we still haven't broken a million dollars um, is mind boggling to me. Uh, and and it's, it's kind of hurtful. You know, um, I, I, I'm all on the news. Uh, Steve Harvey, NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You know, you can see me on the back of the cab in New York. You can uh, you can you can Google me. I got I got awards lined up all over my wall and I'm, I'm still trying to get donations for 10, 20, $30,000 to do work that I've been doing for 12 years. Uh, we, we serve over 1,500 kids a year from underserved community. Uh, just in the last two weeks, uh, I had one student on Monday uh, got uh, um, uh, tapped to be a drone pilot in the United States Air Force. Another one on Monday got tapped to be in a helicopter unit in, in the United States Navy. Um, another student text messaged me and said, I got into a flight training program pro bono this summer. Uh, who's going to pay for these kids to continue their training? I have taken them as far as I can get them to go. And now you know the waterworks is coming, especially is the we are in the, we are in the trenches doing the work and for the dollars and the recognition not just awards and trophies we need dollars to flow to organizations led by women led by minorities that are actually going directly to uh, the needs of uh, and our biggest corporate partner told us when we went through the last round of grant funding they said tamara every year i have to fight for you to get this money, but we want you to know that the biggest seller is that 90% of the funds that we give to your organization does not go, it goes directly to kids. And they know that as a funder, number one, because CPA whooped us into shape with our finances, but number two, um, we have a proven track record of putting those dollars directly where they need to go, not on fancy lunches or banquets, the money goes directly to the kids and I really wish more um, organizations that have big dollars to give would take a look at smaller nonprofits. Um, if you haven't broken that 250000 at $500,000 mark, you look at as high risk and why? Why when, you've, when you have a proven track record that you've done what you said you can do with the money and uh, 
facilities is another one, Doug. Um, all of us know, and we, we probably realize and that we took for granted that we could go and show up to a place and engage and interact with people and have face-to-face -face, face -face, uh, community. Well, young people on the South side of Chicago are running out of safe spaces to go to. If it's not sports, um, they're not going to the Chicago Public Library. You know, we have to create facilities and facilities cost money. I've been looking for a building for four years. Yeah. And, and we have 1500 kids on the South side of Chicago. We have, I can't park my car in my garage for two years. Uh, it's full of stuff, full of airplane models, full of flight simulators, um, everything that we need to take to schools. Uh, we've had stuff stolen and broken into at schools and teachers go into our supplies and start shopping for post-it notes and scissors. And it's like, I've been living out of storage bin for four years and, uh, those are the stories that we need to be more transparent about. As small and nonprofits, we have the capacity to grow, we have the desire to grow, we have the organizational infrastructure. And a lot of times, you know, money isn't the answer to all things. And you, Chicago, uh, the community program accelerator prove that you know by providing all of these other resources the consultancy the 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 um the lit legitimizing of our leadership through the certification um uh, courses and i think if we talk more about it, uh why these dollars aren't going to minority-led nonprofits to women-led nonprofits and those dollars aren't being filtered directly to where the need is uh, I, I think we're going to be able to move the needle and I'm, I'm really proud of you Chicago for taking the step forward, you know, I see the organizations that come into that office on 52nd and Cottage Grove. And uh, they look like me and they come from where we come from and they are getting the support that they need to grow their nonprofits uh, organically. Thank you, Tamara. And I will just say that one of the powerful things about the community programs at Celery when you say that the people coming in look like you is that you know the University of Chicago, we have a lot of people that we work with that are supportive, they've seen the change in the university, but we also have a number of critics. And I will say that the Community Programs Accelerator is one of those programs where I've, I can't tell you how many of our critics have been at the workshops and saying, Derek, you know, I, I go after you on this, but this stuff is really helping me. And I wanna congratulate the university and thank you for it. So um, just emblematic of what you were just saying. So let me speak. There are a couple of questions that are really um, more directed to me, or at least I should be speaking to them. So I want to do that. And then we'll do one wrap up question. I'm going to ask each of the uh, panelists to just to share, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about tonight has been positive, what's great, but I want them to speak to what more can we do? Nothing's ever perfect. There's always more. So just be thinking about that. Um, the first question came in was, um, how does the University of Chicago engage with the city? That um, we've talked about a lot of our work in the community and whatnot, but obviously to do this well, having a good partnership with the city is critical. So they want me to speak to that. And then the second one is about the Obama Presidential Center. So first, let me talk um, about this, our relationship with the city. I will tell you that the city of Chicago has been an absolutely indispensable partner to the University of Chicago. We work incredibly closely with the mayor, the current mayor, the prior mayor, um, and their staffs to um, both coordinate what we're trying to do, to try to be supportive of the mayor's agenda when we can, but also to see how they can support and be an advocate for the South Side in the various strategies and plans that are coming out of, of City Hall. Um, of about, it might be eight or nine years now, the University of Chicago signed an MOU with the city. I think it was the very first MOU between the city and a university. Now all the universities have them, but the first one was the University of Chicago. And the idea behind the, N N the MOU was to say that there's mutual interest between the city and the university. So let's find those opportunities where there's things that we can do and support one another that can advance both the agendas and the interests of both institutions. So a lot of our work on 53rd Street and, and doing things in the, um, the neighborhoods has been in collaboration with the city. We work incredibly closely with CPS. A lot of our research 
works with CPS and the police department where we have agreements on data to do that work. Um, we have this program we started called the, the Civic Leadership Academy. I referenced it earlier. It's a leadership development program for emerging le leaders in the public and nonprofit sector. And when we got that started, the city and the county were our partners in developing it. And they send cohorts of people through the program every year. Now the Harris School of Public Policy runs it. So that partnership is tight. It's incredibly important. And that's not the case with every university. Even some of the universities that you think of, when you think about engaged universities, I remember I talked to someone, I won't name the city, but it's one of the most well-known engaged universities. And I talked to the former mayor and I said, you must have a really tight relationship with that university, I imagine. He said, no, we don't. I don't hear from them. What you guys have in Chicago is very unique. It's very distinctive. It's not necessarily what you see in, in all of the cities across the country. Um, so it's very important to us and we continue to, to cultivate it. The Obama Presidential Center, the question there, um, let me just pull it up. The question there was, um, give me just one second. Could you give an overview of the, of, of the Obama Presidential Center location, progress to date, and to what extent the University of Chicago is working in partnership with them? So it's actually good timing because just yesterday, for those who didn't see it, the Obama Presidential, the Obama Foundation announced that they've completed the various um, review processes at both the federal government and at the city government and they are now going to be moving forward with the groundbreaking for the Obama Presidential Center. The city's doing some infrastructure work, but the, they plan to break ground the second half of this year, and it will be a four-year build. The center is going in Jackson Park, which is one of the Olmstead parks. Um, it's not very far from the University of Chicago, but it sits in the Woodlawn neighborhood and um, very close to the Museum of Science and Industry, if you know where that is. It's gonna be um, just kitty corner from that. And um, for those of us who've been spending the last five, six years dreaming and hoping and trying to um, bring the Obamas back to Chicago and to bring their center here, it's a very rewarding um, moment. It's been a long road, but we're excited about what it will do for the community. And when the Obamas were bidding, one of their criteria was they wanted to be in a location that could have community impact. There's been a lot of work in Woodlawn to try to make sure that the community benefits from the center coming and is not pushed out as a result. And I wanna give the local aldermen um, credit, the city credit and the community activists credit because last year they passed a city ordinance that is designed to preserve affordable housing and make sure that residents in the Woodlawn community can stay in that community and not get pushed out through speculation or gentrification. And we at the university are big believers and supporters of affordable housing and have said we, we participated in those discussions and we'll do what we can to support um, that agenda. So, um, it's an exciting project. There is a lot of collaboration with the university. There was a program at Harris. It's on pause now, but um, where they, the Obama, President sent, President, Obama Foundation sent scholars that also got master's degrees at the Harris School. We're talking to them about our U Chicago local work because they're gonna be a big institution and they wanna see how they can also leverage their economic power to create jobs, to support um, economic development in the neighborhoods also on issues around public safety, that's a priority for the president and there'll be a lot more collaboration, but um, a lot of it's happening at the faculty level or the institute level, but we think there's real opportunity there. Um, so lastly, with our last couple of minutes, come back to that final question to our three panelists. A lot of great stuff you're doing, a lot of great collaboration with the university, but there's always things that we could do better, things we could do more of. Um, any quick ref last reflections on what you see as, as the potential to do more, to do next, or we could do better with respect to our work or our partnership. I'll start with um, Eric. Um, first thing come to mind, I was actually on a panel a few months ago and somebody said something. And when uh, tomorrow I was talking, I was, 
I was with you. I understand what you were coming from. And a lot of uh, white businesses get investments. Black businesses get programs, you know? And it's like, how do you scale? How do you grow when you're not able to have access to capital? The best thing you can give a, a, a small business, uh, even a nonprofit, even for me, is like this public-private partnership of investing in businesses. Mm -hmm. And so anything that, that we could do to support small businesses, to help shore up our communities, um, is what mm -hmm. I would hope to see more of. Great. Thank you. Tamara, you, just I, a quick short answer. It's I agree answer. with that a thousand percent. And the other thing uh, is what we're already talking about um, with uh, the new executive director, Sharon Grant. We had a call um, and she uh, has let me know that her vision moving forward with the Community Programs Accelerator is to create um, a robust network of alumni uh, that we can continue to support each other and work together. Um, mm -hmm. And not that we just get tossed out on the street at, when we're no longer with CPA, but to really, for us to help the other organizations um, understand the process, the support, uh, that they have a CPS and be able to move forward um, knowing that they, like you told me earlier, that you have my back. And that's so, so, so important uh, for us to continue to do the work that we're doing uh, in the community. Thanks, Tamara. Alyssa? I mean, I, I think what Eric and Tamara have both said about, you know, money isn't everything, but it sure helps is absolutely right. Um, it's something I'm hyper aware of with our programs and something that we're thinking about. Um, you know, I think there's a role we could play as a validator to bring other money to businesses. And then I think there's a role we need to play with um, university money and potentially alumni money as well. And so thinking about how we can leverage all of those resources to fill in some gaps in capital that we see in our communities um, is something that I'm focused on this year. Terrific. Well, um, that concludes our Q&A. And I just want to thank the panelists again, Tamara, Alyssa, Eric, you were terrific, and I really appreciate you taking the time to share your work, share your experience, share your stories. I also want to thank the, the guests for the great questions that we got. Um, and it was a tremendous, the audience questions, and it shows the engagement that they had and the commitment that they have. So I'd now like to welcome back um, Keelan Schneider for some closing remarks. Thank you, Derek for this most informative and inspiring presentation on how the university is partnering with the community. And thank you to Alyssa, Eric, and Tamara for highlighting the impact on Chicago's South Side. I know we went a bit over our time trying to get to as many questions as we could, so I greatly appreciate you spending a few more minutes with us. I'd also like to thank all of you for attending today's Leader in Philanthropy program. If you are interested in learning more about the Office of Civic Engagement's initiatives, I encourage you to sign up for their newsletter by visiting civicengagement.uchicago.edu. And again, my deepest gratitude to all of you and your continued support of the University of Chicago.